behind the scenes with Hollywood's power players. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Reba. Starts now. Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Uh, First, I'd like to thank all of our listeners for tuning in today. We're very excited to be here. And, uh, you know, make sure you come back. We're going to be here every single Tuesday at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time on UBNRadio.com Channel 1. So, Reba, what's the show going to be today? Well, the show is kind of interesting. I'm going to, well, I'll let you interview her too, but I really want to interview Rachel DiPillo, and I'll tell you why. She has not stopped working, and in Hollywood, that is probably gold. Absolutely. I mean, that's an actor's dream. More than being a star, I think, is to always be working and pursuing your craft. And I know that her career has been mostly studio, which is why it's going to be mostly your interview. But she does do it. She's done a little bit of indie. No, no, no. She's not an indie. I mean, this is an equal opportunity guest. (laughs) She will talk to both of us. I know. She's crossing the lines back and forth, and we're excited to learn more about that. Well, let me tell you something. Since I came from the studio side, what is the indie side really like? Is that why you have gray hair and I'm just a blonde? Absolutely. If, if you look back four years ago when I started uh, Mousetrap Films and Film Festival Flicks, I didn't have a single gray hair on my head. Uh, I, I, I literally, it was, I started out this path because I saw all these incredible films that everybody was making. They were working so hard and then they were being lost. They were going to the festivals and then that was the end of it. Yet we know that there's an audience who cares and wanted to see them. And I believe that it was possible to connect the two. And so... What I found was in the indie world, you have people that are collectively working together and they're bringing their craft, they're bringing their passion, they're bringing their creativity. They don't always have money for like explosions they and chases. They never have money. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's like the epitome of the starving artist, but it doesn't have to be because some indies actually make more money than the studio films do. I know you're going to be surprised, but I really did work on some indie films. Actually, most of the time I was hired by a production company, and then we would all pray that it would get a distributor and then I would get paid. I mean, I got paid for the, what I started. One of the things that excited me about Hollywood was that I'm a fan of movies. I love to lose myself in history or in sci-fi or in another world. And so when I came to Hollywood, and I, I, I don't know if you were born yet, but I, I came a long time ago. <laughs> I came as a fan. And, and, and you know something? I have never been disappointed. Even though there's nasty things that happen to me, it, nasty things happen to everybody. Um, overall, I would say that I was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time, and I grabbed the brass ring and knew what to do with it. And I bet you that's the same thing for you. Absolutely. I I came to Hollywood um, having been a performer and a producer, and and I was both uh, confident enough and naive enough to make my own path and to break through and not fall prey to what the industry told people they couldn't do or the path that they should take. And so I, I managed to have an amazing time, and it didn't mean that I didn't have to pay my dues and go through some very, very difficult times, but this is, this is a great town. I mean, it's a town of opportunity where you really can make anything happen. Well, it's a town of opportunity if you get the break, if you get your foot in the door. Do you know how many talented people are out there? I mean, the thing is that it goes back to an interview that I did with Harrison Ford, the man that doesn't really like to talk a lot except when he talks to me. And he said that he came out with a whole group of young, aspiring actors And they didn't last because they didn't get that break. I mean, he got the break only because he was he was making kitchen cabinets for famous people and they gave him a break. Yeah, absolutely. I I think that goes to it. It's like no matter whether it's indie or studio, I think who, you know, makes a difference. Absolutely. And who do we know? We know that we have some incredible sponsors, don't we? We do. We're we're very pleased to have Conundrum Wine, both red and white. Uh, so if you have a conundrum, you don't know what to make with your food or what to have a drink, it's, a, it's an ex- extremely simple wine that it goes with everything. You can't go wrong. And you know what? You can't go wrong if you stay tuned because a very charming Rachel DePilo is going to jo- join us after these messages. Conundrum has been turning winemaking on its head for 25 years. 
Conundrum White is the original white wine blend from California. Pair this exotic, versatile wine with everything from Asian cuisine to tacos. Conundrum Red is rich, full-flavored, and balanced, the perfect complement to dishes like pasta pomodoro, fajitas, and barbecue. Drink it slightly chilled, perfect for summer. You'll find Conundrum Red and White wines at your favorite restaurants, wine shops, or supermarket. Go to wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Again, that's wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Find your wine, find your adventure. Nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches is Reba Merrill's intriguing look at hidden Hollywood. Find out what movie stars are really like in this behind-the-scenes Hollywood tell-all. The story of Reba's extraordinary life interwoven with an insider's look at achieving fame and success in the entertainment industry. A must-read. Buy nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches at RebaMerrill.com, Amazon.com, or ask for it at fine bookstores. Nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. You'll love it. Barkeeper in Silver Lake has the finest cocktail shakers and vintage glassware and barware from the mid-century to new. And let's not forget about Barkeeper's unique spirits, 150 different kinds of bitters, and their unique gifts. In fact, Barkeeper provided a lot of the vintage barware for Mad Men. BarkeeperSilverLake.com. Don't wait to visit their store or their website at BarkeeperSilverLake.com. It's your very own Barkeeper catalog for unique gifts. Conundrum, we're going to toast our first guest on our first show, Rachel Tequila. To you, Rachel. To you guys. Thank you. Well, let me talk about Hollywood. In Hollywood, visibility is the game. Mm. Because with visibility comes fame. Because everybody gets to see you, and the more they see you, they offer you more and more. And with fame comes the ultimate ticket, power. And that's really the Hollywood game. And we're fortunate enough to have Rachel DePillo with us today. And man, is she on the fast track. <laughs> okay. I know that you're young. We won't do ages. We're not doing numbers. But I know that at 18, you were kind of picked by a, a, a scout from Disney uh, and said that you have something. How about coming to LA? Now, I'm a mother, I have daughters. What did your mother say when this came up? My mother is a very creative woman, and um, I grew up watching her do theater productions and then dancing and dancing with her, and it's all kind of been in the family. So by the time 18 and this opportunity came around, uh, she was naturally very supportive. Did you come out alone? I did, but she and I had made a few trips before the move actually happened together so that she need fear less and I would have a little support before officially flying out of the nest. Okay, so how did you make coming to L.A., and you got to admit at 18 you're still a little naive, you might be much more sophisticated today, but in those days you were. How did you make your life work? What did you, where did you stay that was safe? How did you know about jobs? Did you get an agent? Did you get a manager? Tell me, <laughs> how did you do this? Um, I met my manager before I moved. That was the, the scout. Um, and that was sort of a, a home base of connections of which acting class to take and how to get more representation. Um, and it was through acting class where I met my first roommate, um, an actress named BK Cannon, and she and I hit it off, and she had a room that was available, and so the first three years we spent together, and um, our moms loved each other, and the stars sort of aligned in that way. Do you remember your first job? And did you scream privately after you got it? <laughs> I think I screamed on the phone with my agents for a handful of jobs. There was nothing private about it. Um, but my first job was... 
I auditioned on the Paramount lot and worked on a Nickelodeon show called Big Time Rush as pretty girl number one. You know, it was like two lines. I was very nervous to audition for two lines, but I thought I can handle two lines. I can handle that responsibility and went in and was very excited about do, it. Do all di- many, wait a minute, wait, let me just wait, ask wait, her one thing about auditions, because okay. I could <laughs> never audition. Were you going to ask no, no, Well, a little bit. I was going to say, how many years of training went into being prepared for those two lines? Um, years, I mean, I've been doing theater for most of my life, but understanding the way acting for cameras goes, I was in class for a few months at that point, um, breaking down tiny little pieces so that I could utter two sentences and feel good about that. Now can I ask her? Yeah. Now I'll I'll, I'll let you ask what you want. Okay. Okay. Uh, I want to know about auditions because I interviewed people like Al Pacino, and he has a total theory on on auditions. He does not read the two lines they want him to read. Mm -hmm. He had prepared his own role. Now, you're going to go in and do at 18 an audition. How did you do it? I read what they told you to read. I thought I wouldn't have gotten the job if I made up my own character. Um, I was just interested in booking something, and that meant putting my own spin on the material that they had provided to serve their story. Okay. So what choice did you make for it? Um, Pretty to be, girl, to be one. To be myself. <laughs> there wasn't much else other than to be energetic and want to talk to the people I was talking to. I don't even remember what the lines were, but it was simple enough. <laughs> On your first job, were you excited or were you scared? Oh, both. Both? Yeah, yeah. I think they go hand in hand. I think... Um, that's being a little bit nervous is what makes the job exciting sometimes. Hmm. Do you get nervous? I do. Um, not as much anymore in what I do, but I used to, when I used to be on stage, at, especially when I wasn't performing all the time, I was petrified. I, I put more value in what people thought of me than whether a physical challenge, whether I lived or died. That's the, that's the conundrum, is that we that are creative think more about what people think of us Mm -hmm. than we value who we are. I mean, you're very young, and I'm sure you feel pretty good about what you've done in this short career. But She doesn't seem very young. She is. She's 24. Do you know what 24 looks like? Well, yeah, it's across the table. (laughs) What I was getting at is, is... I forgot what I was getting. <laughs> that, that, that happens. It's okay. Here, have some wine. <laughs> so, so let's talk, you, talk a little bit about, you've had a pathway that's led from one job to the next of amazing TV shows mm-hmm. and a lot of what, what, what I would consider more studio because it is mainstream. And then you came along and you did an indie movie. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what prompted you to kind of jump over onto the independent side? Um... For me, auditioning, as far as who's producing the content, is very equal opportunity. If there are people that are good at what they do, seem that they will be good to work with. And I think the content is either educating or inspiring, or I gravitate toward it in some way. now, the film, Hello, My Name is Frank, you're mm-hmm. helping an older man with suffering from Tourette's syndrome. And you'd said earlier that you had volunteered about a year ago, like at a, a senior home. Mm-hmm. Were the two connected or were you just wanting to, to help out and give back? Um, I don't think the two are necessarily connected. Certainly my experience with Hello, My Name is Frank was a big um, opening for me. It's a really, really great team of what I found to be exceptionally kind and passionate and honest people that were a joy to work with. Um, I don't think it was a conscious decision that they were related or not, but certainly I love old people. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I mean, do you, do you pull a lot from your life experiences to bring to your characters? I don't know what other experience I have to bring to my characters. She's really lucky she's still pe- playing her age. Or younger. I mean, she wait till you get to play my age. Then you'll really need some experience. But here's the thing: Did you learn anything about Tourette syndrome from 
doing the film? Oh yeah, um, I did some research during the audition process and then I learned a lot about what it actively looks like um, through Garrett M. Brown, who plays Frank's um, research that he brought to his character. He did a very thorough job in understanding um, ticks and what the behaviors um, physically are like so that by the time I was done with filming I felt like I'd hung out with a man with Tourette's for many many hours and it felt normal to me. Okay this is a studio question. Mm -hmm. On this film did you have your own trailer? Did they have big deal catering? Was there uh, security? And did you have first aid? First aid. Oh, oh yeah, we absolutely. used to have doctors on our sets. What did you have on yours? Oh man, well we definitely had first aid. Okay. Um, and I think in some locations we had trailers, but in some locations, no, no, never a trailer. Like holding areas, um, but oftentimes we were all together. Um, so no, very different than making like a. a studio but you're TV ready show. to step into a very big world as a lead in an NBC series that has been pick, picked up called Cuckoo. Oh, I wish it was picked up already. It is in limbo right now. Oh, you're, you're on the bubble. We're in the, is that what you call it, the bubble? Yeah. So, yes, NBC has unfortunately passed on Cuckoo, but um, other companies are taking meetings, and so we don't know if it's going to go or not. But let's say it does. What's your question? <laughs> <laughs> My question is... Are you prepared? Because doing a major television series, even though Jane the Virgin, you're in there, but you're not the lead of Jane the Virgin, mm -hmm. you would be the lead, your life will change. And do you ever think about what happens when wonderful Rachel can walk down the street at this point and still have a life to when it goes away? Well, um, I don't try to think about that very much. Um will come to that or cross that bridge if good, and when I come to it. Do you have a good disguise picked out yet? No, Dark but I, I just saw that Kevin Bacon does. He <laughs> said he's got some prosthetic, some tiny little simple thing that makes him absolutely unrecognizable and that he doesn't like wearing it because people don't love him as much. He said it's terrible <laughs> just being a regular person. <laughs> See, at funny. first it's tough and then you, you grow to like it. Yeah, well, I don't know if I ever would. I think uh, it would be very isolating. I, I have to tell you something. I think Fane, which sounds like it's wonderful, can be very cruel. And it really can because say, yeah. you know, you're still young. You're going to eventually get married. You're going to have children. And your life is going to be intruded upon. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and the more you say, I don't want it, then they like say, yeah, yeah, but you, you signed up for this. Right. At this point, you're at the best of both worlds. You're working. Mm -hmm. But you still have a private life. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen when that goes away? Have you ever thought about what it could do to you? I have taken great care to nourish my personal life as well as I try to nourish my career um, so that I have my life in place and have an anchor. Um, but as far as how that would affect me, I have no idea because I haven't experienced it. Well, before you crush her. Um, <laughs> Do I look like I'm kidding? Before crushed? you rob her dreams and make her question everything she's doing, on the bright side, okay. when you do get famous and powerful and your name actually on the marquee sells tickets, then you have the power to go into the independent world and create stories, tell stories and create films that you want. That's very true. And people will rush to give you money to finance them. And directors will line up to help direct them. Mm -hmm. And then you can not only do the great work on TV and on the big screen that you can, but you can also tell stories that are meaningful to you. And I think that's an exciting place and an exciting balance where I start to see it more and more, especially with the agencies, that they agree that they'll do the next Marvel Comics movie in exchange that the studio is also going to finance this little passion project over here. Well, the thing is that I sat down with... Um, Sandra Bullock for Hope Floats, mm -hmm. and she was willing to do Speed 2, which she knew was not a good movie, mm -hmm. because they gave her the money for her to produce and star in Hope Floats, which mm -hmm. was a small movie. Mm -hmm. But it was delicious. I mean, it was a <laughs> wonderful experience. Okay, so it was released by Fox, but the feeling was, compared to, you know, 100 million, this was 17 million, that, but they gave it the full blowout. So, I mean, that's something you get to look forward to is that with power comes, look at Reese Witherspoon, picking projects, starring in them, producing them. 
you know, that's where the young women, I guess, today are going. And I know you didn't think about that, did you? I think I thought about it a you little did. bit. Are there stories that you want to tell? Um, yes. Are you going to tell us any? No. No. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to have you back for those. <laughs> you know, th this woman is 24 and already knows the Hollywood game. Who taught you the game? Many people. <laughs> it's been a long couple of years. This is a more personal story. You were on the set of Mad Men. Mm -hmm. Tell, oh, please, because it's one of my favorite series, and I thought I was really Joan. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell me what it was like. I just, I, I hate to do, I never do this, but... The series ended. You're the closest person I have because John isn't <laughs> here right now. Tell me what it was like. Um, well, I didn't think I was going to get that job. Um, I learned once I got to set that it had gone to two other girls that had to pull out for some reason before they called me up the night before it shot and said, hey, can you come do this? And so I got there and the hair and makeup and wardrobe was a delightful because of their period. Straight 60s garbs, gazillions of rings and necklaces. Um, and then their set was a really well-oiled machine. They've been together. They have the best people at what they do. Um, and so that was really cool to see work and function. And the Johns were very professional, very charming, and very handsome. And... The Johns? The Johns. So I worked with John Hamm and John Slattery. And, and were you in the office then? No, no. I was in a hotel room. Oh, and what kind of girl did you play? A hippie. <laughs> oh, you brought the sandwich. Yes. Oh, my God. I did watch yes. the series. <laughs> oh, let me tell you. Let me tell you who she really played. She played. A hippie is kind. Slattery could have been her grandfather. And... <laughs> Well, am I saying something that's wrong? No, but that doesn't mean it's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> so she was his sideline girlfriend. <laughs> she yes. was a hippie, but she was, woo, oh, I guess you, oh, yeah, and, and both of them were there for that scene because yes. you came back with the sandwich. I'm sorry, I did see no, it. No, it's okay. You have a fan. I... <laughs> okay, I let you talk. <laughs> I'm just having such a good so, time. So, so, so back on, back on uh, Hello, My Name is Frank. Yes. It, it, it premiered at the Newport Beach Film Festival and is coming up this weekend. It's mm -hmm. going to be playing at Dances with Film. Yes. Are, the, are you going to be there for that big I event? will be there. We are at the TCL Theater on Saturday the 6th at 2.45 p.m. to premiere yeah. in L.A. And is this the first time that you've been in, had a film that was in a lot of film festivals? No, no. I did another independent feature a couple years ago okay. that has been making the rounds, but this one is the closest to home and, and definitely more recent. That's great. So are your friends and family coming out to be a part of this? My family is not, but hopefully some friends, yeah. That's great. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And, and then do you know yet what the life of that film is going to, where it's going to go after this? No, I think this is the time, as I'm sure you know, that we... Um, we figure that out as it begins its life at film festivals and hopefully find some a home and some distribution and is it, and is it just a film that you hope people will enjoy or is there a deeper meaning with the threats and hopefully bringing awareness to uh, people that are afflicted i think it's it's both of those things um i love the story because it is a very real story there are people that i don't think um often get represented in film that this uh, movie is concerned with um, and I forgot the other part of your question no I think we'll enjoy it but I, I, it'll be great I mean I, I love to see a meaningful film because I mean my mm -hmm. only you know what comes to mind when I think of Tourette's is typically like Deuce Bigelow Mel Gigolo okay, um, okay. Which, which was a much more comedic look at, yeah. at someone with Tourette's well, well the character of Frank is is very fully developed and his world is very fully developed so I think um, a lot of different people can get meaning out of it we've got mm -hmm. young girls on the brink of college and starting the rest of their lives with varying world views um, who are stuck in a car for a week with this man with Tourette's that none of them really know and uh, he's been very sheltered and they all kind of grow up together in this unexpected experience so I think there's a little something for everyone to get out of that. Can I go back to the studio side? Yeah, Thank I, you very much. I know you've appeared in Jane the Virgin and mm -hmm. is that on the bubble or has that been picked up? 
That has definitely been picked up. Now, compare that to uh, Mad Men. Is that well oiled? I mean, this is in second year already. Mm -hmm. And what did you think of the clothes? I thought, I mean, they're spot on. They do a really good job with creating their world. Um, I had a really fun time in the clothes that I was wearing. They were much more Miami and much more modern day than that of Mad Men. Um, and I think they have a really great team. I, it's not as like adult and sophisticated as the Mad Men world, but it's really well put together. Is it a jinx to ask what's on the horizon? I, I, I always feel funny asking people, what's next? What's next? Do you hurry up? Do you have more? <laughs> um, I'm still figuring that out myself. Well, I meant, uh, do you have any more jobs coming up? No, that's what I'm still <laughs> figuring out. I, yeah. I, I once heard Angela Lansbury say that every time she gets a job, she's both excited but wonders if it will be her last. So mm. the path you're pursuing is an incredible one, but it's not easy. And so congratulations. I appreciate that. It seems like that. you're well on your way and you've got your head on straight. Thank you very and much. And you know something? I want to thank you for joining us. I mean, it was the premiere show. You got to see us try to act like we know how to be hosts. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing our, we're really doing our best. You're and, doing a great job. You know, we figured this one might be the junk show, but it's turning out pretty good. <laughs> well, that's because she glued us together. She did. She worked both sides of the street, and I don't mean that in disparaging. <laughs> I work both sides of the street. <laughs> she went <laughs> She went from and You can quote her on that one. Yeah, you could Please. I think Please. you're in good company. <laughs> uh, I I would like to propose something. You want to propose to me? Yes. Okay. Um, a few more hits under there. Do you think you would be willing to come back and join us again? You're a delight. And I like people that are just starting their career because they have only one place to go up. <laughs> and so I hope you'll remember us and I hope you will join us again. I would be happy to come back. Thank you. It was You're a welcome. pleasure interviewing Rachel I, no. I had a good time. I had a great time, too. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for having me, And I me, hope that the, the entire world gets to see your work. Oh, God. Because we'd like to applaud you. <laughs> well, no, you've already done the work. Now they just have to watch it. Oh, yes. gosh. That's All not right. intimidating. <laughs> we well, do applaud you. you. And thank we're you. thrilled that you were here. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. We'll be right back. Rebham has been turning winemaking on its head for 25 years. Conundrum White is the original white wine blend from California. Pair this exotic, versatile wine with everything from Asian cuisine to tacos. Conundrum Red is rich, full-flavored, and balanced, the perfect complement to dishes like pasta pomodoro, fajitas, and barbecue. Drink it slightly chilled, perfect for summer. You'll find Conundrum Red and White wines at your favorite restaurants, wine shops, or supermarket. Go to wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Again, that's wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Find your wine, find your adventure. Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches is Reba Merrill's intriguing look at hidden Hollywood. Find out what movie stars are really like in this behind-the-scenes Hollywood tell-all. The story of Reba's extraordinary life interwoven with an insider's look at achieving fame and success in the entertainment industry. A must-read. Buy Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches at RebaMerrill.com, Amazon.com, or ask for it at fine bookstores. Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. You'll love it. Barkeeper in Silver Lake has the finest cocktail shakers and vintage glassware and barware from the mid-century to new. And let's not forget about Barkeeper's unique spirits, 150 different kinds of bitters, and their unique gifts. In fact, Barkeeper provided a lot of the vintage barware for Mad Men. BarkeeperSilverLake.com. Don't wait to visit their store or their website at BarkeeperSilverLake.com. It's your very own Barkeeper catalog for unique gifts. with Hollywood's Power Players. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Ben and Reba. Starts now. 
Our, my next guest, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so used to working alone. Our next guest is Jorge Hernandez, an entrepreneur who took all his skills and talents from the music industry and stepped into a strange new world. I say that because I always identify myself as the generation without the thumbs. So oh. I'm not big in the internet, but you are big in the internet. How in the world did you come up with Derelicious? Uh, and, I, and I think you're the best person to explain I it to so. me. I think so, probably. So first of all, I wanna thank you for having me on the show. Um, and I got to give a shout out to Ben for the uh, Deuce Bigelow reference. I did not see that coming in the last segment. That was that was pretty hilarious. Well, when I when I think of Tretz, that's the first thing that comes to mind, <laughs> which I know their film is much more meaningful, but I, that, I can't help it. That you refer to this as the junk show. I was like, oh, okay. But it's anyway, <laughs> so uh, Darelicious. Let's get back to that. So Darelicious, very simply, it's the online destination where you can dare yourself, your friend, or a celebrity to take on a dare while you're earning money for your favorite charity or cause. Now, how many people dare themselves? That's kind of an interesting play. Well, it's funny that you that you say that because w when we first came, you know, when you start one of these things, you have all these kind of hypotheses and ideas and presuppositions of what's going to happen, and almost all of them don't come to pass because you're just, even if it's a few of you thinking about this, you're thinking about it's in a bubble, and then people get their hands on it, and they decide how to use it. But I, I, I really thought that it would be more about people daring other people, but a lot of people come on the site and they think, okay, I have this in mind. I want to raise money for this. I have the dare in mind. And they just kind of take it, take, you know, take the, uh, take the bull by the horn, so to speak. Now, I, now I read that you started this when you were with a group of friends and they dared you for $20 to eat all the, the pepper packets on your plate. Right. So yeah. So what happened was, so uh, I was, uh, I was finishing an MBA at Anderson at uh, UCLA. And, uh, whenever they have a, a school meeting there, they always cater it with pizza and for whatever reason these guys bring like way more pepper than there is even pizza so a buddy of mine asked to uh asked a few of us to help clean up after one of these meetings so i stuck around and one of them just decided to be really silly and was like hey jorge how much to uh to eat a whole packet of this i dare you 20 bucks and somebody else said i'll give you 20 bucks if you and then they got more and more creative with the dare we'll just leave it at that in terms of what to do with the red pepper but uh after a while it's kind of funny because what really happened was you saw you know, we talk about crowdfunding all the time online, but that was sort of like real world crowdfunding, right? Everybody was throwing in their money and their energy into like one cause, which was to see me do these ridiculous things with the red pepper packet. No, I, I know the feeling. I was in New York. We were at an all-you-can-eat sushi place uh, between shows when I was performing at Radio City. And I had like a bowl of like a wasabi and soy sauce mix. And my buddy said, I'll give you 20 bucks to drink it. <laughs> sure enough, I downed it. And then within seconds of it hitting my stomach, I turned the same color as that mix mixture. So what what happened to you after you ate all those pepper packets? Well, I didn't, for the record, I did not do it. So my <laughs> price was a lot higher than there. I think they probably had a, you know, a few hundred bucks after that. It's like, so I guess I was a cheap date. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but when I left there, what was interesting to me is as I left, because I, I had already been thinking about crowdfunding. I really liked the space. And I also was thinking that, you know, I needed to do something that was different, that was kind of set me apart from everybody else that was crowdfunding online. Um, and so that it, it, it just really hit me afterwards, like maybe by the time I got to my car, of like, okay, that that's there's an idea there. How can we online, how can we motivate people to create dares? Um, and then how do we fund these things? Like what's the motivation behind that? And that's well, where Darelicious was born. Did you use what you knew from uh, from being in the music industry which has got to be a tough business you were successful there and and that's the question you were successful why would you want to go and start something that's scary I, I, at least i think it's scary well i think on the mu in the music side I, I, it, and it's it, you were speaking to an actress before and we it, it's really one of those things where it there it's all scary right Re regardless of whether you're starting an online company or whether you're in the music business because there's just you know if you're a doctor you can pretty much plan out what your career is going to look like right if you're in the music business regardless of whether you're on the executive side or whether you're on the talent side if you're just in that ecosystem there there is no way to really kind of plan out how that's gonna how that's gonna you know work for you or not so that kind of uncertainty really didn't was already a part of my life so going into the online space of creating something there wasn't uh, wasn't an, an, an issue for me there at all. And as far as the music space was concerned, it it felt like it, at at that point it really felt like I needed to do something different because that space, as you know, has become so fragmented and and it's just so much harder to actually um, 
to create a, to make a living in that space more than anything. Well, you brought up make a living. How in the world do you make money from this? I mean, I, I hate to pry. Oh no, 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 not at all. So we take a commission on anything that's that's uh, raised on the site, uh, and then as the site grows, we'll obviously offer advertising as well to uh, to any prospective uh, individuals that want to that that want to sponsor any of the. We've had that already on a few of the campaigns. So essentially, if you want to, if well, you've got Conundrum Wine in front of you. So if they wanted to sponsor one of the dares, they could. They could basically buy a sponsorship package and be completely. Uh, they could be completely represented in whichever campaign they are they're interested in. What? Wait, let me just no, say, I was going to say like it? like to, to give them a plug. I mean, we believe this really does solve every problem in the world, no matter what your conundrum is. I think short term, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I suppose maybe excessive drinking is not going to solve that problem. But I, you know, if something smells a little fishy, you got white. If it's a little bit of a meaty problem, you got red. Yeah, no, I think short term, it's a great solution. <laughs> I, I wondered if you'd share um, one of your more successful dares and tell me how it came about, what you got out of it. I won't ask how much money your commission was, but how much money was sure. raised that actually went to where the dare was? So we had a campaign called uh, Jump for Jude. I'll give you a few highlights. I'll give you sort of my favorite campaigns that have been on the site. So Jump for Jude was, uh, there was an individual who has a godchild who still to this day has an undiagnosed but life-threatening illness. And uh, this child's parents had been to every children's hospital you could think of, and they couldn't really find out what was going on. So they had one place to go to, and they wanted to raise money for that trip. So she's petrified of heights, and her best friend is petrified of heights. So they created a campaign called Jump for Jude, which was they were going to go skydiving. So that's what they did. They, they created this really fun intro video that really gave you a sense for the need that the family was facing and certainly their own trepidation of doing something like this. And, uh, and they raised a little over $32,000 and they jumped out of a plane at the end of it. And everybody got to see that. And, and did they get to, to, to do any training at like the indoor skydiving center up here no, at Universal they did Studios? Not. They, like, they went cold turkey. They wow. just showed up <laughs> and they did like whatever training they give you there on the spot and they got in a plane and that was it. See, I've always wondered, why would you jump out of a perfectly good airplane? Because I'm raising money for a worthy cause. Yeah, that's that was it, and that yeah, that was the answer in that case. We had so, I'll, I'll tell you, an, a very early on, we had a dare that I, I, it's one of my favorite ones. It's one of the first ones we did, which was we had a uh, stay-at-home mom who, her whole life, she when she was growing up, she never participated in sports because she was always picked on. It was always a source of anxiety for her because of the way her classmates uh, treated her. So she grew up with this. Um, and then when she had girls of her own who were very athletic, she decided, you know, she wanted to be an example to them. So she wanted to find a way to get over that. So what she did was she dared herself, speaking of, she dared herself to do a uh, 5K and a 75-story stair climb, which, and this is the cool thing about the site, is to some people that doesn't sound terribly daring, right? Millions of people run a 5K, and lots of people will do a stair climb. But for her, it was a huge act of daring. And it was really empowering because at the end of the day, after she did that, she got really into CrossFit. I mean, she is like a workout junkie now. It just was a completely transformative experience for her. Well, I think it's it, what's your point is that Wait too. A it's like no, no, How no. How much money did she raise? Oh, and that was, and again, one of my favorite shares, but she didn't raise yeah. a lot of money. She raised just under a thousand bucks. Well, I, see, I think it's the achievement and being excited to celebrate whatever people achieve because you, you have children, right. I have children, Reba's got grown children, but. When you have children, you get excited when they do something like sit up. Right, <laughs> anything. Yeah, I mean, and, and so it's like same thing. Like if you t watch kids learn how to do sports, like the, the, the simplest gestures of like running and jumping over like a block becomes exciting again. And so I think it's important that we never get jaded to realize that for someone running a 5K and a 75-story stair climb is a huge achievement. Right, right, and exactly. And, and again, you know, if you, if you talk to an extreme sports individual, Jumping out of a plane is no big deal to them, right? But for these two people that did that, it was a huge act of daring. And then we have stuff that's just kind of, I would say, just fun, um, that not necessarily, um, that, that's more about the individual taking them on, just kind of stepping out of their comfort zone. So we had, uh, we had a dare where this individual is the executive director of a local charity here in L.A., um, she was a former, I believe, the dean of the law school at USC. So somebody that I think most people would kind of looked as very buttoned down, very serious. And on her 50th birthday, she was climbing Mount Kilimanjaro with her 23-year-old daughter. And so the dare was that when she got to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, she would do the Macarena with her daughter. So again, it was just pe and, that, and people that knew her and people that supported that organization 
were really were moved by that more than anything just because it was it just seems so out of character and so kind of funny and fun thing to do now are there videos of these Cause like, yes. like like we right now we just opened up our our call for submission but we do an online mountain and adventure film festival and so if there's films like this as you know we'd love to see them get out to the world and share both their achievement, but also the Darelicious platform through this worldwide film festival that we do. That'd be great. And everything that we do, when the the way you actually complete one of these campaigns is the person has to upload proof that they that they did great. the uh, dare. So every one of them has video. Now, but, wait a minute. Can okay. I, who makes the video? I looked on your website, and those videos are very classy. Oh, thank you. Um, for the most part, we uh, at Darelicious, we if if individuals are having a hard time editing these things, we'll help them edit them. But for the most part, the individuals creating these campaigns, they're shooting all the stuff. You know, we don't we don't really shoot any of it. We mm. we will we will step in and edit if they're having a hard time. So in a way, this is kind of on the honor system. All it, of this. In, uh, well, you have to be honorable to tell them how much money they raise. Does the money come to you and then you give it back? How do, how does that work? Well, basically, so yeah, it comes to us and we give it back. Yep, yeah. but we give them a full accounting of everything. Now. Gosh, I'm going to say I'm, I'm having my senior moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, then let me ask them this question. How big an influence was the ice bucket challenge to what you're doing? It, it's funny because we were already, I mean, we, we had already built the platform. We were already live before that came around. And we were even looking at, so that kind of, the ice bucket thing came out of something called nominations. Yeah. And nominations were basically, okay, I'm on Facebook. I take on a some kind of silly simple challenge and now i nominate a bunch of friends so that really that came out of that whole uh, movement on facebook and so we were already looking at okay how do we integrate that in our platform because our platform was already made right so after that we thought okay well what if we build a platform where people can do these simple kind of challenges and we just recently launched that we so we have like a i would call it a sister site to darelicious called just tag me and that is that's basically it, everything that that people did with the ice bucket that but found it a little bit um, cold. No, <laughs> well, no, but, found, <laughs> but they found it a little bit difficult to basically go. Okay, now I have to post my video here, but I have to donate here, and they didn't have everything in one place. We've sort of we've provided a platform where everything takes place in one location. It's just a lot easier for you in terms of a user experience. And can I ask how this was financed originally? I mean, you have an idea, but how do you make an idea become? You're a company. Right. So initially, there were a couple of us that just, you know, it was a lot of money that a few of us put in. But then we ended up getting uh, financed by a local venture capital firm here in L.A. and one angel investor. So wow. That's that great. Now, now, let's say I, I go, I put up a dare. Is the promotion and funding of, is it really based upon my ability to drive my audience to it? Or do you have an organic audience that's really spending time on the side and looking for fun dares that they want to get behind? I think that th this is the interesting thing with crowdfunding is I think there's a perception that there are sites where that's automatically going to happen. But I would, I would say any crowdfunding site, ours, whether it's ours or any of uh, the other crowdfunding sites that are out there, we all have one thing in common that it definitely starts, the campaign starts with the individuals that create this. Mm -hmm that if any momentum isn't created out of that, it's really hard to just all of, all of a sudden get just strangers interested in it. It just doesn't work that way. Um, so to answer your question, definitely it all starts with you. On our end, we you know we do media outreach on any of the campaigns that we think are interesting. Um, to obviously to push that along, and that's what we did with Jump for Jude. We thought, okay, this is a really compelling campaign. Let's get behind this. And that really worked out for them. That's great. Well, it sounds like great. it's a great platform doing great things for great causes and a lot of fun. Well, give them how they find him because, you know, I don't do WWWs well. I know. I know. It's the .com that gets in there. <laughs> so, so you go to darelicious.com, D-A-R-E-L-I-C-I-O-U-S dot com. That's correct. And I think an easy way to think of it, think of the word delicious. Just put an A and an R after the D and you're good. And where did that name come from? Who? Because Delicious is such a girl name. Right. So it's it's interesting. We were we were playing around with a bunch of other names, like uh, Daretastic was one of them, and uh, that was one that I particularly liked. And uh, but one of the original founders really loved Delicious, and I mean so much so that I've, for me, it was like Daretastic, Delicious. I'm good either way. So I just kind of said, okay, cool, Delicious it is. And I want to thank you, Jorge, because I actually thought you were delicious. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you for <laughs> thank joining you. us. And remember, you can dare and actually make it happen on darelicious.com. See, I did one. All right. So now thank we're gonna, you. Appreciate it. We're going to go to commercial, and we'll be right back. Conundrum has been turning winemaking on its head for 25 years. Conundrum White is the original white wine blend from California. 
Pair this exotic, versatile wine with everything from Asian cuisine to tacos. Conundrum Red is rich, full-flavored, and balanced, the perfect complement to dishes like pasta pomodoro, fajitas, and barbecue. Drink it slightly chilled, perfect for summer. You'll find Conundrum Red and White wines at your favorite restaurants, wine shops, or supermarket. Go to wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Again, that's wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Find your wine, find your adventure. Nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches is Reba Merrill's intriguing look at hidden Hollywood. Find out what movie stars are really like in this behind-the-scenes Hollywood tell-all. The story of Reba's extraordinary life interwoven with an insider's look at achieving fame and success in the entertainment industry. A must-read. Buy nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches at RebaMerrill.com, Amazon.com, or ask for it at fine bookstores. Nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. You'll love it. Barkeeper in Silver Lake has the finest cocktail shakers and vintage glassware and barware from the mid-century to new. And let's not forget about Barkeeper's unique spirits, 150 different kinds of bitters, and their unique gifts. In fact, Barkeeper provided a lot of the vintage barware for Mad Men. BarkeeperSilverLake.com. Don't wait to visit their store or their website at BarkeeperSilverLake.com. It's your very own Barkeeper catalog for unique gifts. Yes, we're back. And here we are. We've come towards the end of the show. And I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's been a great time. And if if you missed this show, which I guess if you're watching it, you probably didn't. But if you want to tell somebody about it, you can catch the show on uh, UBN.com, on YouTube, at FilmFestivalFlix.com. Uh, you can see it on iTunes. And if you want to get follow us directly, you can follow Reba at RebaMerrill.com or on Twitter at the, the Reba Merrill. Merrill. Yep. And then or uh, myself, Ben, over over at uh, at Festival Flicks and at Film Festival Flicks, where you can also see the show. Uh, join us next week. Who are we going to have next week? I don't know. Well, here. Oh, so they wrote it for us. It? Scott Takata. Oh, my goodness. I've seen him, too. I saw Gone Girl, and I saw Dallas Spires Club. I I see four movies a weekend, so you know I see a lot of movies. Okay. Well, wait, got, wait, 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 I, I got to say, no, I, I read Gone Girl. It, it was so unnerving, I couldn't bear to go see the well, film. As a man, I would imagine it would have been unnerving. Oh, it was. I was like, I've dated girls like that. It's it's not it's not fun. That's a nightmare. But I haven't dated guys like that. I know. Well, I, that, I was talking, actually, last night when I got my hair cut, we were talking about Gone Girl. And we, we agreed that it's like really everybody in that film is despicable. It was hard to like anyone. I thought they all lived in Hollywood. Oh, excuse me. I didn't mean to. Well, did you have a good time? I had a great time. Did you? We, yeah. we, we, we're good together. <laughs> we're good together. You tell your wife. I'll tell my husband. And I guess we'll keep doing this. You know, now that Bruce is Caitlin, it's a modern world. Oh, I'm so glad that, you That's Bruce me. Jenner, in case anybody didn't know. I guess we get to say goodbye. Is that it? I guess so. All right. So how do we end this? Oh, that's a wrap. Well, it is a wrap. And so, you know what? Here, have, well, a, have, a, have, a, have a little bit more. You, You've you, been drinking well. Yes. Yeah. It looks like you drank all of this. Okay. Even though. You do the toast because you're the guy. All right. So to the first Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Which wasn't junky at all. Not at all. And I would actually like to thank our sponsors, Conundrum Wine. And the barkeepers. The, exactly. Cheers. We'll Cheers. see you next week. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Ben and